There's a lot of things going on in the world today. A lot of things that bother us, weigh on us, and we want to make them better. We want to do the right thing. We want to encourage others to do the right thing. But very often, the discourse breaks down into just yelling, screaming, shame, and guilt. What we really want to do is build a house of justice where we're working towards the betterment of all. Let's talk about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan druid and I am joined today by my husband. Hello, I'm Brian. I'm a Christopagan druid and a sous chef to the dog die. Today, under the light of the full moon, as we're thinking about the Via Transformativa, we wanted to talk about one of the Noahide laws, one of the seven laws of Noah. We're going to be digging into those a lot deeper in future. One of them is that we are to go forth and build houses of judge of justice. I think we all feel that instinct. We have a bent inside of us that wants to curve towards what we often confuse with fairness, but we want justice. In the world today, it is hard to see justice getting done. We can go down the list, the litany of the way our court system is set up to systemically oppress and pull down so many groups of people in this country. It's painful. We can look at the way that our society is structured to ensure that everyone does not have an equal opportunity to get ahead and live their dreams. A lot of it has to do with that hypocrisy in general. We'll watch somebody talk about or preach getting rid of lies. And then everybody rallies around that ideal and then make up lies and accept lies to accept the leader when the entire movement's supposed to be anti-lies. Truth and civility are often the first casualties of any fight for justice. I don't want it to sound like I'm denigrating anyone who's fighting for justice. It's just easy to exaggerate once you start allowing a little exaggeration and a little coloring of the truth, then truth can go out the window or worse. We get so blinded by our cause because we know it to be just that we start becoming cruel, vicious, hostile to each other, to people who don't see the path that we see so clearly before us. It's a struggle. It's a fight. And it's a fight that we all have to face. We all have our issues, whatever they are, that are so pressing that it's hard for us to understand how other people don't make that their whole life, their whole work. Like, how is everything not focused on this one thing? And I'm trying not to call out any one particular issue because this is really true for almost any issue you can think of that is related to justice, fairness, equality, goodness, in any good cause. Yeah, even if you think back to the five powers, if the cause becomes all-consuming, then it is the moment that you're in, which means you're no longer in the present moment. It obfuscates. So you're unable to be mindful. You're unable to see things for what they are. And therefore, the wisdom is flawed. The faith that comes out of that is flawed. And everything else becomes flawed. I don't even know if it's flawed. This is why the five powers is such a valuable tool. Because many of us get to the point of concentration by accident, where we are focused in and seeing the thing and don't take that next step into wisdom we get stuck we get caught it's easy to get caught especially with the various things that are going on right now from global warming and climate change and social justice in the united states or what's happening in gaza or in ukraine or what's happening in sudan right now it's very easy to get into that moment of concentration where you are seeing the problems you're seeing potential solutions, and now you can't see anything else. Yeah, That's where that fifth step really becomes powerful because, yes, we can taint and learn the wrong lessons and go to folly instead of wisdom and start breaking the whole system. 
But a lot of us get trapped in concentration, just seeing this one problem. Where they just do the three steps. It's concentration that feeds into effort, that feeds into problems with mindlessness, because now all you're seeing is just that one element of the moment and not anything else, which then feeds back into more concentrated concentration, because now the only bits of data that you've collected from the mindfulness is only on that topic and you saw nothing else and folly and yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we around. break the system. This is why we always talk about how the five powers are so important, making sure that we're going through all five and not getting stuck in one of them. Most people, especially on a spiritual path, get stuck in faith. Yeah. How do I have faith? And they don't let themselves have that initial trust to build effort and mindfulness and concentration and wisdom from. They just get stuck in faith or they get stuck at wisdom. They think this is the end all and be all of all things and don't feed everything back through the system again to refine and keep improving and making better. They think I am now the all wise, the almighty, the whatever. Once we take a problem like this, like justice, and we start feeding it through, we realize that our first step is to develop faith. What is justice? Justice is going to look different in different situations. Justice is equity. It is equality. It is bringing to bear often the power of the state, though sometimes just our interactions with each other into a right and honest and equal relationship so that no one is causing harm to another and that any causes of harm are somehow restored or ameliorated is the word I'm looking for. And that's a big ask for a lot of these things. It's why we have in our practice, the two laws, the two laws give you that foundation of faith to start with. And we just talked about them a couple of days ago, loving God, with all your heart, mind, and spirit, loving your neighbor as yourself. The faith starts with that place of love because that, that will help with the justice that will help with then the, the effort then in that mindfulness and in that concentration you can start picking out how were those interactions how did that actually play out like the apostle john reminds us that when we are operating in faith in that love true love casts out all fear i think this is where a lot of us go wrong is once you have that fear cast out we start acting heedlessly, recklessly. We are no longer paying attention to the things that we really need to be paying attention to because we no longer have that fear, that concern holding us back. Don't get me wrong. I am not saying that we should be fearful creatures. That's not what I am saying at all. That's not the point of what I'm saying. It's just there's so many things that we have to be careful about. So many things we have to be careful with so that we don't distract ourselves because justice is a hard road to walk. Building a house of justice is even harder because it's easy for us as individuals to sit back and say, this is the right thing to do. Now get another person in the room and say that sentence again. They're going to be like, what? what about, what about, what about, which is why we get blinded. It's, we don't want to have those conversations because no, 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 no. Anything that we do to lessen our focus on the right and just cause that we are participating in is distracting from the right and just cause that we, we don't compromise with evil. This is where I like to take a moment to point towards science as one of our answers to this. Science, in, in their efforts to map the brain, has realized that Brains are so different, each one from the other. We are physically wired differently. So therefore, there is no one solution. There can't be. It just wouldn't, it doesn't make sense it, because it isn't, which is part of that challenge with justice and building a house of justice is making sure that there's room, there's enough space there for everyone because your brain is wired differently from the other person's brain, from the third person's brain from the fourth person's brain their way of thinking and some of them are very dramatic so what works for you is great for you 
but that doesn't mean that has to be or even can work for the other person in the room with you in that house of justice. It's, it's that balance. It's why it's such a narrow path. It's about that inclusiveness. It's why there's no room for judgment in justice. You're discerning, but you can't judge because the minute you judge, you're excluding others and not including. As someone coming from a druidic practice, this is where, for me, the Gorseth prayer comes in. Because the Gorseth is the prayer of exaltation. It is, we're here to gather and we are exalting. We are ra raising everything up. We are putting things into their proper perspective. I get to say the controversial man's name again. Yolo Morgano wrote several versions of this prayer and of course attributed them to various sources that we cannot find them in. The one that is most commonly used in Druid circles. I'm going to read it the way Yolo originally wrote it. A lot of groups change the word God, spirit, source, insert whatever you feel is most appropriate here. But I'm going to read it simply the way Yolo wrote it. Grant, O God, thy protection, and in protection, strength, and in strength, understanding, and in understanding, knowledge, and in knowledge, the knowledge of justice, and in the knowledge of justice, the love of it, and in that love, the love of all existences, and in the love of all existences, the love of God. God and all goodness. This really has been the rallying cry for Druidry since the revival. Again, as I always say when we bring up Yolo Morgano, whatever you think of him and what he did, he has had such an impact on the movement that we, we can't ignore him. I'm sure a lot of people, especially if you've been in a Druid meeting of any kind, have heard this prayer, a version of this prayer. It is core to who we are. You can see the steps that he's taking us through here. There is great wisdom in here, especially if we are going to bring about justice and be a house of justice. We first ask for protection, protection from outside enemies and inside enemies, because enemies come from within your own heart, as well as within your community and from outside. So first, protection. We first ask for protection. And more importantly, before we ask for the next thing, which is strength, because if you have strength and are acting from a place of fear and uncertainty and doubt, you have a higher likelihood to lash out. So we first work for our own security, then for strength. See, this is building an idea here for us. And in strength, understanding. Understanding is not wisdom or knowledge. It's that meeting place between the two where you have to take into effect the facts, which is knowledge, and the experiences of others, which is wisdom, and find that middle ground, understanding. How do we understand how our experiences relate to the facts, how our experiences relate to other people's experiences, but we start, we're strong, we're protected. We can now go for understanding. We're not even to justice yet. We're just at understanding. How do we figure out the issues in front of us? And from understanding, we go to knowledge. Now, why don't we go to knowledge first? This is a good question. And I don't know how many people think about this. Why don't we go to knowledge before understanding? Because if I don't know what the situation is, I will look for the wrong things. If I tell you that there is systemic racism in housing in the United States, or look for systemic racism in housing in the United States, you might not know where to look. But if we start from a place of understanding, and I talk to you about redlining and white flight from the cities, and, 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 and how that affects tax policy. See, this is all understanding not knowledge. I'm showing you the relationships. Knowledge is cold, dead facts. Anytime you are showing the interrelationship of things, that is understanding, not knowledge. People get confused about that. This is something that a lot of people, yes, are confused about, but they also have said and understand on a fundamental level. This is where you hear a lot of times brought into the argument, but you don't understand the context You'll hear that phrase over and over again. The context makes the difference. Yes, there's the facts, or the facts were used to misrepresent the situation. That's exactly what it is. The facts, the knowledge came in and were arranged in a way to show an inaccurate relationship. Why do we have to understand history? How could something that happened hundreds of years ago affect us? A couple hundred years ago, 
a group that we now refer to as the Founding Fathers, agreed to leave all of the important banking stuff in a city called New York. Well, the government and all of those apparatchiks of power were going to be moved to the new capital, which first moved from New York to Philadelphia and eventually to Washington, D.C. All of the banking was going to be left in New York. So all of the money had to flow through New York. And now New York is the most important city for all of our commerce. That's where the stock exchange is on. That's where the money flows through. That's where all of the power brokers come and meet. This is a decision that happened hundreds of years ago that is still affecting us today and how our economy works. Little decisions that may not seem all that important back then. And I love the way it actually gets highlighted in Hamilton, the musical. You sold out the capital by letting it move down south. Yeah, but we're keeping the money. So, I mean, who really has the power, right? Yeah. They, they, they made decisions. They made backroom deals. The National Bank was not moved to Washington, D.C. It was left in New York. All of the financial power was left there. And to this day, New York City is this powerhouse that has such a strong impact on everything we do as a country and everything we do as a global economy because of a decision that happened hundreds of years ago. Decisions have long-reaching effects. And that's why understanding comes first. And now we have understanding. Now we go to knowledge. What facts led to this? What laws caused this to happen? What specific actions are repeatedly being taken for the thing? And now we've gone from understanding to knowledge. And now the knowledge of justice. Ah, but what would be equitable? compassionate all of the things that we want to bring to bear on the idea of justice they come in now i remember having this argument about gay marriage back before it was made legal when people were asking us well you've been together for all these years do you really need a piece of paper to tell you about your relationship blah 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 blah, blah. and so we would explain well we need a special document so that if one of us got sick we could visit each other in the hospital if we're not married we would need a special document to make medical decisions for each other should something happen to us if we're not married. And we started going down the rights, how inheritance works, how loans work, how taxes work, and started going through all of not only the facts, but how it affects us as people. And people started seeing this interwoven set of rights and responsibilities and privileges that have been put into this institution. What's interesting here is the knowledge of justice starts rising in them and they start asking, should that be tied to marriage? Because some of the things you sit back and go, wait, that, that's tied to, wait, what? But now we're having the, the actual discussion. What is the right thing to do? What is the just thing to do? But we had to take people on the road where they understood our situation, how things are laid out now, and the actual points of why this actually matters. We had been together for almost 20 years by the time we got legally married. That piece of paper was not necessary to show our relationship, right? I still cried when I signed it because I understood all of the other legal protections and legal rights and responsibilities that came along with that little sheet of paper. And that is the knowledge of justice and then the love of it. Now, this is important. This is the important part. This is where I think most of our activist movements get wrong. We need to operate from a place of love, not hate. Our enemies operate out of hate. If we're going to fight for actual justice, we have to operate from a place of love. I love my community. I love my people. I am working for their betterment and their benefit. I want to see the laws treat my queer siblings better, my pagan siblings better, Oh, there's a lot of stuff even there that we could get into. I want to see us treat our sister streams and our brother mountains better. But we're operating in a, out of a place of love because we're here to protect these things, not to take down the other person or the other institution or the other whatever. Because if you're trying to take down the other, you're not working for justice anymore. You're working for revenge. If you're working for a place of revenge and retribution, you're not actually trying to get justice anymore. In addition to that, the other problems with working from hate is, yes, it is a powerful emotion. You could draw power from it. But like the path to the dark side, 
it is a quick and short gain for lots of problems. Problem one, we're warned. When you cast out demons, they're going to come back sevenfold. Say you hate sin. The minute you start hating sin, you then go to war against it. If you're going to war, that means there are enemies. Now you're creating enemies that are starting to multiply because you're creating more and more enemies because you have to fight against it. Now you have more and more enemies fighting against you. It has come back sevenfold. And then those seven you attack have come back 49fold and over and over again. And people wonder why sin's grown so much because we keep hating sin. We keep hating injustice. injustice. And that hatred just creates more enemies. It, it comes back sevenfold. The second problem to couple with that or, or thing to be warned about that is you become that which you hate. You do. The minute you start hating, you're putting up those blinders. You're not able to be mindful. You're not able to take in all the, the information, the data points you need. So your concentration gets off. You become so consumed by it. Folly leads you into becoming it. And you easily start doing that very thing that you hate. We can see it over and over and over again. You look back into history and there are so many examples of people starting out from a place of justice and wanting to do good. As they say, the road to hell is paved with great intentions. It's a well-paved freeway because that hate blocks and obscures and leads them to becoming that which they hate. And they themselves start perpetuating it. That's why our intentions are important. Because when we're operating out of a place of hate rather than love, we have a target, not a solution. When we're operating out of hate and not love, we are not sustaining ourselves. Hate is not a sustainable resource. Catch me on this because I don't think people understand this well enough because they're like, well, it's worked for enough for me right now. I hear that when I have this yeah. conversation with people. Hate requires the thing that you hate to be there. You have now entered a symbiotic relationship with what you're trying to stop. You are not going to try to actually stop it because if it goes away, you lose purpose, you lose a sense of meaning, you lose a sense of significance, and your universe falls apart without it. Oh no, you need to keep it around. So you start nibbling around the sides, you start engaging in more and more hostile actions so that the discourse, the argument, the fight continues. You score points in the fight, but you don't actually score points towards actual victory. If you're operating from anything other than love, if you're operating for love of your community, love of nature, it doesn't matter if fossil fuels stay around anymore. But if you are operating out of a place of hatred, if we actually get rid of fossil fuels, you don't have a purpose for being anymore. You are going to unconsciously or even consciously sabotage any victories you could have and you're actually working against the cause because self-preservation is the first rule of life things want to live if you hinge your existence on despising hating or working against another thing your instincts whether you're conscious of it or not your instincts will guide you to keep that Thing alive so that you stay alive even if you know in your mind that it's killing you because without it what are you that's why you have to work from this place of love it's not feely touchy feely it's not any of those reasons if i'm working for love of nature nature will be here one way or the other fossil fuels don't have to be. if i'm working for a love of the community the community will be here whether or not those hateful, discriminating laws are or not. See, the thing that's giving me hope, the thing that's giving me strength, is the very thing that will be here regardless, and even and especially in absence of the thing we are working against. And that is how you actually build a house of justice. That is how you actually work for justice. It's easy to get distracted off that path. It is easy to try other things. I actually talk about this a bit more in the sermon that came out over the weekend over on the Church of the Oak on how we need to build each other up, how we need to reimagine and rebuild ourselves so that we can work towards a fairer, better world for everyone. So if you need more, <laughs> I highly encourage you to go over there and check that out. 
also there will be more in the future as we celebrate the full moon and the path of the Via Transformativa. It is path of justice. Not and just justice. Not justice, just justice. justice. Celebration. And celebration. Transformation. That transformative justice. And taking that time to reflect, to remind. It's every day. Every day we, we try to make better that which God made perfect. Amen. So we'd love to know what you're working for. For, not against, for. Let us know in the comments. If you're listening to us on Spotify or on YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. We'll get to see it be able to respond to you there if you're anywhere else you can leave a comment there but they won't let us know that you did it so after you type it out select all copy we can still post it there so that we get engagement there but then go over to creationspaths.com and click on chat and then paste it over there so that we can actually see it and respond to you we really do love getting all the comments that you all have been giving us Rick, you've been encouraging us in this work more than y'all might realize. Thank you so much. While you're over at Creations Pass, if you happen to have a few dollars that you could pass our way, you could join up and take on a membership there. We're going to be putting out some classes in the not-too-distant future over there. So we'll be giving those to the members first. Then they'll go out to everybody else. We'll let you know more about that as they get closer. If you'd rather support us somewhere else, you can support us on Patreon and Ko-fi. I'm C.E. Dorset on both, C-E-D-O-R-S-E-T-T. And there you're supporting everything I do, from music to the stories to everything. This has kind of become my life right now, so I'm not doing as much of the others, but that supports everything. And like I like to remind you, you're not giving to the Lord. You are just helping us to keep the electricity on and put on our table. Thank you all so much to everybody who does that. If you know anybody that would benefit from any of the work that we're doing, Share it with them. That helps out more than you possibly know. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, may the strength of the one life rise up in you and teach you to love and to take that love into action to bring justice and healing and restoration to this world so that we may leave a better world in the world to come for our ancestors who are coming back to our children yet to be born and for ourselves when we get there. Amen. Amen. Amen.